question number one. I think normally we, we ask the sort of, uh, you know, background, backstory question. But in your case, thanks to the upside of irrationality, we know that. Uh, so I think the question is more, how did you end up here? So, so sort of why did you choose behavioral economics? Um, and how did that portion happen? What was the driving factor? So, um, as, as, as you know, but, uh, my, my whole, my whole indifference to this was driven by being very badly injured. And my approach to life has basically been trying to think about what we can improve. So when I was uh, in the early days in the burn department, and later on, my first inclination was actually to try and be a physician. Okay. I saw physicians around me uh, making lots of mistakes, but also being incredibly helpful. And, and I wanted to help. And, um, it turns out that my hands are so badly burned that I cannot really hold any medical instrument. So this path was blocked for me. Uh, and I think if my hands were not as badly burned, I probably would have gone down that path. But, but for me, uh, social science and behavioral economics was a, a way to try and fix things that I think are wrong. So I think kind of the, I had this uh, instinct to try and fix things. And, uh, it's been a tremendous tool, I have to say. I'm, um, I'm, I'm traveling the world, I'm meeting with people from companies and governments and non profits uh, in a couple of hours. Uh, I'm moving to Africa. Um, there's a lot of things that we do in terms of designing the world around us that if we understood human nature, we would do very differently. So I think it's an amazing time for social science to try and help us uh, redesign the world in a better way. Okay, perfect. So we have we have uh, three themes. Uh, the first one is going to be irrationality, which EB is going to cover. Then I'm going to do dishonesty, and then we come come to sort of fun and you. So so we're again hoping to cover it all. So over to EB now. Right. Uh, thanks so much for the great research that you do, Dan. Uh, were there some uh, results that uh, that you came across during your research that uh, really surprised you? Can you can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, were there any results in your research that uh, surprised you? That any results that surprised you? Surprise like, we were, what we were wondering is, you know, was it always like, yes, I have this hypothesis, oh, I do this experiment, and boom, okay, kind of shows up as, as I expected. So, you know, what were the results that blew you away? Yeah, so, so, so first, first of all, yes. yes. And the, the, the results, results that surprised me often are the, the first, first experiment, experiment, and then, then I... I Think about, about it, and, and then, then I say, oh, yes, I should, I should have, have done this as well, and now I understand it, and then I do the second and the third. So, so by the time I like do the fifth experiment, I'm not always, I'm not always, always surprised. surprised. <coughs> um, you know, there's some things that surprise me just by, just by seeing them. So, you know, if, even when I read about some paper on loss aversion or on anchoring effect, Doing it for myself for the first time, the first time I did the experiment, just surprised me again. You know, you just, you just see the data. There's something, for me, there's something really magical about looking at data and seeing if the pattern uh, emerge. It's just, it's just wonderful. Um, now, if I think about surprising things, I think that recently the thing that surprised me the most was the consistency of honesty and dishonesty across the world. So, um, some of my students in the last year have been running around the world doing our experiments in different places. So we've done these honesty experiments in South America and in Europe and in China. Uh, and I expected these large differences, right? We all have uh, stereotypes and prejudices. I'm not going to ask you for yours. But, but so many people that I meet say, oh, yeah, people in my country cheat much more than the... That was American. my reaction. <laughs> uh, but but the basically, when we put people in a, in a room and we give them a chance to cheat with no consequences, we only find tiny differences. Um, and, you know, we've done it on hundreds of people. And I have to say, we've done it twice because I didn't believe it. Uh, actually, this is terrible, but the experiment we did in Colombia, South America, was the one I didn't believe the most. How can the Colombia and the South America? 
And it, it wasn't, wasn't just me, because, because the student who was running it was from South America, and she wouldn't <laughs> believe it. So we ran it twice to be extra sure, and it's indeed the case. So sometimes the differences, and sometimes it's the lack of differences. But, but the reality is that every day of getting data is kind of a new, a new wonderful day. It's kind of you get to unwrap a gift and see uh, what, what you find. Fantastic. That's really wonderful. Um, so um, every day, governments can play a huge role in uh, saving us from ourselves. Uh, for example, Singapore government has an opt-out uh, system for organ donation, which means by default you opt in for uh, organ donation. And recently, the case of uh, UK uh, that you have to opt in for uh, opt out for uh, opt in for watching op porn. opt in for watching porn. Uh, what are your thoughts on on this? So, so I think of course, uh, governments have the capacity to do tremendous amount of good intervention, and they also have a tremendous capacity to do bad intervention. And I think uh, it is important to figure out what are the rules that govern our interventions. And to the extent that it's driven by science, I'm happier about it, and to the extent it's driven by intuition, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that we really have to think about how we want to weigh freedom versus authority. Yeah. So think about driving, right? None of us is opposed to the government regulating driving. You have to be a certain age, you can't uh, drink while driving, you have to indicate, stop at red light. I mean, the amount of <coughs> regulation, limitation of driving is very substantial. And the reason we don't object to it is that we see the cost. We see people dying on the side of the road if the government is not intervening in this regard. The problem is that with other things, we don't necessarily see the human consequences. So if the government, for example, is not intervening in obesity, or if the government is not intervening in medicine, we don't see the large consequences. But they're there, but they're just not visible. So, so for me, there are kind of two principles that we need to think about. The first one is, is this intervention driven by data or not? And the second thing is to figure out how do we weigh human freedom compared to human benefits, uh, to the extent that the government is basing their opinion about data, there's no question they can restrict us more and we will be healthier and live longer. Um, for example, my case, in my case, you know, if somebody eliminated chocolate whatsoever, uh, no, maybe there's some benefit for chocolate, but, but let's assume the chocolate is uh, incredibly tasty but not the healthiest. We could think about a situation in which uh, chocolate was eliminated to save me from myself. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we get into difficult states in which you say, well, human fun and human freedom are also, also important. So, I think that there are cases in which it's quite clear that the government should intervene, and then there are cases in which things are much more complex. And, Thankfully, there's lots of places where I think interventions are useful and clear, and we should start with those, and then over time figure out the more complex ones. Is there and one? For is, example, is, is, yeah. If you think about the regulation of the banking system, I think that's one we just learned a big lesson. It's time to intervene and regulate to a higher degree. Um, the same thing works for medicine, clean water, clean air, and so on. Perfect. So I, I'm going to move to the next stage, which is dishonesty. Uh, so I have to thank you. Now, uh, my, my background, when I was in university, piracy was the norm. Uh, it was not even thought about. And seriously, two years into work, I did not think about it until I read your book and, uh, and you know, all of the societal aspects of dishonesty. And I have to say, I also have to give credit to Clayton Christensen because I read his book and, you know, right after I read yours and it was marginal cost theory. And he said, you know, there's no such thing as a little dishonesty. It's like, you know, you're, you're either 100% or you're not. And ever since then, I've kind of completely uh, deleted all, uh, I don't know how many ever gigs of pirated uh, content and, and have been buying uh, sort of real, uh, 
you know, legal content. And, you know, Dan, I, this is almost a different topic, but uh, Apple makes it so hard for you to do so when you're not in the U.S. So I've almost had to be a little dishonest uh, in terms of having a U.S. address to, to buy my own stuff. But hey, uh, so, you know, I owe you a big thank you, right? Uh, I can see, I can see, um, I guess, so many things that have been better ever since. Uh, but the big turning point was your book. So I guess the question to you, and, and now I'm on this mission to convert my friends, right? And, uh, and one of the things that keeps coming back is, is dishonesty ever justified? And I'll give you an example, uh, which is if a man steals a loaf of bread for his dying family, uh, is, is dishonesty pardoned? Is there something as a small, you know, a small bad action? What are, your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, so I think that, yes, dishonesty is, uh, part of human nature, and I think it plays an important role in, in society. So if you think about, you know, the ancient question, honey, how do I look in that dress? Um, but, but I'll give you an example. I, two days ago, I, I lied to a, a, a friend of mine. Uh, this was a guy who was going into a difficult uh, surgery for his hand. And I had lots of surgeries on my hand, and he's going into this surgery in about two weeks. And he asked me how much pain I think he will have. Now, if I told him the perfect truth, he would be very worried for two weeks, and then he would have another two months of pain. Uh, if I didn't tell him the truth, he would be a little less worried for two weeks, and then have the same amount of pain uh, at the end. And you know, I didn't do the full computation, but I thought that he sounded worried. And I wanted to, I wanted him to worry less. Actually, I thought about the moments of getting into surgery and the uncertainty and the fear and the unpleasantness connected to it. I had these images of uh, being taken on a stretcher into the operating room and I, I wanted to reduce his anxiety, and I told him that he will have probably less pain. Um, so, so this is a case, you know, is, is it justified or not? Um, this was a particular lie in which I did not have much benefit. Uh, it, was, it was done for him, and it did not change the consequences of his action, of the, the final outcome, maybe it only improved it. So, so I have a hard time thinking that this was not a good, a good, not simple, I'm not saying it's simple to lie at this point, but, but I don't think of it as, uh, it, it, it's probably in the category of good things, and, and I think there are things like this. Um, the problem, of course, is a lot of things in other categories as well. Fair enough. So, so I guess the question is, you know, what have your biggest learnings been, uh, and, and probably the biggest, and, and I think the next question is, are you happier for it? You know, you probably know um, humans strip bare, right? Like you can look at something and you, you, you know how irrational we are. Uh, do you feel it's made you a happier person or has it made you more cynical of our, uh, of our actions? So, so I think that uh, personally, I, I've taken this uh, research in two ways that make my life better. The first one is that there are some things I do better. Um, I know some mistakes and I try not to get into them. Uh, where do you want to live, uh, how do you live your life, what kind of things you do and don't do, how do I approach uh, experiences. Um, in terms of optimistic and pessimistic about life, I think there's, a, there's a, a version of this in which you say, my goodness, we're limited. And because we're so limited, this is just a sad view of human life and everybody I see is not as perfect and wonderful as they are. Uh, I, I look at it differently. I look at the whole world and I say, is this a place that is the outcome of 7 billion rational people? Now, if, this was, if everybody was perfectly rational, this would have been the best world imaginable. And, and the conclusion I think very easily is not. Uh, in a couple of hours I'm leaving for Africa uh, where you know, there's a tremendous amount of uh, illness and poverty. Um, but also a tremendous amount of hope. And if this world is not the outcome of 7 billion rational people, maybe we could do better. So, so it's true that when you look at individuals, you can say, for each individual, 
I wish they were rational or more rational in some ways than needs to be said. But for the planet as a whole, you say, my goodness, the gap between where we are and where we could be is tremendous. And there's a lot of things to improve. And uh, I, I think we can do much, much less. And that's my hope. My hope is that as we're learning more, we would uh, improve things. Um, so, so both in terms of my personal life and in terms of uh, my outlook at the world in general, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, you know, it's, it's also very sad. Um, this morning before talking to you, um, I talked to a kid who was uh, badly burned. Um, somebody drunk uh, drove into his car and his car exploded and he got badly burned. And <clears throat> he's in the hospital, it's been two months, it's going to take a while before he gets uh, better. And, you know, it's very hard to look at this and not, not think about the, the very quick mistake of one driver and the, the tremendous consequences it had on this kid and his family for a very long time. You know, sometimes when people have accidents and they pass away, uh, you think it's very sad. I often think that the sadder thing is when people survive because uh, now the, the pain is just starting and the duration of suffering. And, you know, I can't help but say, you know, what, what a human waste of a, one terrible decision creating terrible consequences. And that, 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 that kind of thing saddens me to, to a large degree, I think, because I just see the, the amount of human stupidity in this, in this regard all around us. Uh, but I try to balance it with, with some hope of doing better. Perfect. Uh, we'll move on to some uh, fun questions. What What are your favorite books uh, that you go back to read? Yeah, again, the line broke a little bit. So, uh, what are your favorite books? What are my favorite books? <clears throat> um, so, so one of my favorite uh, authors is uh, P. J. Woodhouse. He's a He's a British author who writes about uh, a master and his servants, uh, Wooster and Jesus. Yes. And I'm a big fan of his writing style. Uh, uh, the, the, the master, uh, Wooster, is a really not very smart guy who gets dragged into all kinds of um, instances by the power of other people and the environment and his own foolishness and Jesus is uh, the smart butler who gets him out of that in very clever ways. And, and Woodhouse has a beautiful language. He describes the world in an interesting way, but he also describes human emotions and motivations. And it, it's really, a, a, for me, it's a discussion between our two sides, the more rational, thoughtful, deliberative, planning side and the more foolish the uh, immediate side, uh, in this case, in two separate people. And it, it's really an unraveling stories of, of human nature. So I, I love, I love those, uh, I love, I love Woodhouse. There's another very short book that I love a lot called Three Men in a Boat, huh. also by a British author called Jerome K. Jerome, uh, written, you know, over 120 years ago, I think. But what's interesting about this book is how well he captures human nature. And I read this book and I think to myself, you know, he, so for example, he has a part in which he describes how he rides, drives around town and all of these pedestrians are just kind of trying to commit suicide and running into the car and not caring and so on. And then he becomes a pedestrian and very quickly his perception changes. <laughs> and all of a sudden he thinks about the drivers are trying to kill him and the pedestrians have the right of way and so on. And he has lots of those kind of deep psychological insights ah. that are very interesting, and some of them I've even done research on. Oh, fantastic. Any, any uh, I guess, quickly, any movies and or TV shows as well that you are a big fan of? So, um, I'm actually, I actually love a TV series. Which? Uh, I, I don't get much chance to watch TV, but I, I watch it on flights. Yeah. And I started it on a flight from India to China. 
which was a very long flight, and I watched a TV series called 24, which is kind of a, <laughs> yes. a espionage um, terrorism show. Yeah. And it was an amazing experience because it's a long flight. I would fall asleep. I, would not, I was not sure where I am. The noise of the flight, I would wake up kind of half having memories and uh, dreams about the show and half being on the flight. And the whole combination was just this amazingly emotional experience. So since then, I've been trying to to watch on flights. I used to only work on flights. Now I, I only watch um, things on flights. Uh, I, I'm probably behind the times. I'm not watching something uh, current, but uh, I'm watching now a series called Breaking Bad. <clears throat> and, and it's an interesting series. Uh, and it's a guy who is, who's basically become a drug dealer. Yeah. Uh, and drug manufacturer out of out of necessity, and I think it's an interesting uh, show to get us to think about uh, reality and and crime. So uh, I'm I'm enjoying that as well. Dan, if you get a chance, uh, do check out something called The Game of Thrones. Um, you 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 will particularly like it because it's not it's basically not good versus bad, but a whole bunch of morally ambiguous characters who are you know, facing decisions in terms, in, in just situations where they have to take calls. Uh, so I have a feeling you'll really like it. Yeah, so I watched, I watched the Game of Thrones. It was actually interesting because uh, I had to watch it as homework. <laughs> I got, I was asked to interview Peter Dinklage. Oh, wonderful. Who's uh, the Did actor, one of the main actors in this, in this show. So we got to be on stage together and I, uh, asked him some questions about uh, life as an actor through the perspective of uh, behavioral economics. <clears throat> and it, it was really kind, quite interesting. I was trying to uh, get him to reflect on his profession as, as a function of this. And I'll, I'll just share with you one thing. Um, I asked him about the roles of expectations. You know, if you know that something is going to be of a particular type, it changes your expectations. And I said, you know, actors these days, we know a lot about them. And can we really filter this out and experience them in a new role? Or is every role really associated with previous roles? And he said that he thinks that one of the greatest actors ever was Marlon Brando. And he said that Marlon Brando gave only one interview. Um, and that because of that, he could go into a different role. And of course, people had some knowledge about him from previous roles, but people didn't know much about his personal life. Uh -huh. And he said that these days, every actor, you know everything about them. Uh, there's so much information. I mean, if you care, you can find out. And that actually makes it much tougher for them to really adopt the role and for the audience to truly believe that. Uh -huh. And... It was kind of an interesting contrast between actors' desire for fame on one hand and our desire for information on the other hand and the potential negative aspect of that information. Oh, that's fantastic. That, that, we're, I know we're, we have three minutes and we have two of our favorite questions. So we're gonna, I'm going to try and package it into one and then, and then have you go. So we see you doing so many things, TED Talks, books, research, aside from teaching and traveling the world. I guess our favorite question, one of our favorite questions is how do you fit it all in in the sense of what are your productivity hacks, right, uh, that, that you use, especially, you know, given you can't type, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the, the next kind of continuation of it is what is something that inspires you um, on a daily basis that you would like to share um, with us? So put two together. So, so productivity hacks, um, I basically try not to waste time. Um, what, what I do is when I get tired of one task, I move to another one. I think often when people get tired of one thing, they say, oh, let me go to Facebook and I'll get some energy and I'll go back to this. Um, when I get tired of one thing, I just switch to, to something else. So I think the amount of hours I end up uh, working is much, is much higher because of that. I'm also a big fan of coffee, so I, I stay awake uh, more hours. 
Um, in terms of the thing that in, inspire me, you know, one of the really magical things that happened with this, with, with my books, was that I, I got to meet people that told me that I changed something about their lives. Uh, very quickly after I wrote my first book, Really Rational, I met a woman on the flight. She was sitting next to me. And she was so excited to, to have me next to her. And she told me that she was diabetic. And she was debating whether to install an insulin pump or whether to keep on taking the injections. And in her mind, she had a discussion with me about what I would say about this. And she concluded that I would say that she should take her, put the insulin pump, in, uh, do the surgery. And then she went ahead and did that. And it, it just amazed me that you can put something out there in the world and people read it and think about it and take it seriously and maybe uh, make a, a better decision or two. Um, and it's such a tremendous uh, feedback and motivation. And since then, I've met other people that I got to uh, influence. And, and I can't tell you how gratifying and motivating this is. You can add one more now, uh, now that you know, especially with the, with the whole dishonesty piece. Uh, so, yeah, no, thank you so much, Dan. Mm -hmm.